أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful And may God's peace and blessings be upon his holy prophet Muhammad And the purified members of his household and progeny Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad So before I jump into today's topic And it'll be short for today I wanted to see if anyone can quickly summarize what we covered in the last couple of weeks. Alaykum as So can anyone at least, do you remember what we covered last week and the week before that? Before Shahar Muharram, we had a couple of jalsat. Uh, we've been progressing in one, one line of thinking. We've been building on it. But at least for last week, do you remember what we covered last week? Talked about Fatra. We talked about Fatra. So... What did we say about Fatra? Things that we talked about, we discussed things that are like Fatri, which means on instinct or not, and give examples, we tried to ask a couple of questions. If you will. So does anyone remember what we said about for something to be Fatri or be instinctive or be natural to a human being? What are some of the criteria that it must meet? How do I know if something is instinctive or not? Yeah. One, it cannot be taught to someone. Okay. It be developed over time. And two, uh, you have to notice it. If, if you go back in time, it'll still be there. It can't be like just for today. Like yesterday, it's not there. Today, it's here. It has to be like all oh, history of humanity has got to be there. So you actually mentioned all three in, in the two. So one of them is that it's universal to all human beings. If you see that something is universal, that means it's found in every human being. So regardless of their age, regardless of their gender, uh, their race, their religion, if you find it in everybody, that's fitri, that's one. The second one is that if you go back in time, it's not something that can change too. And three, the point that you mentioned is true, is that it's not something that can be taught, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be developed over time. It just means that you were born with it. It's part of our nature. We're born with this. And some things don't necessarily evolve. It stays the same our whole life, some instincts, and some instincts evolve. They all can evolve. We can get better at an instinct, at using an instinct. And we gave examples. If I go and take a course on learning how to sleep better, we know that there are courses about this now, right? So you can go take a course. They teach you what you can do, for instance, to relax so that you sleep better, you sleep more deeply. Uh, so that you have less nightmares, that you don't wake up as much if you fall asleep, so you're not interrupted, and so that you feel the most refreshed when you wake up. Okay, there are courses about this. There are courses to teach mothers how to deal with their children, right? So does it mean that a mother doesn't have an instinct naturally to deal with her children? No. A mother has an instinct to deal with her children, but you can make it even better. You can polish the instinct and make it even better, take it to another level and fully benefit from it more. So sleeping is instinctive to a human being. A mother's love for her children is instinctive, but you can make it better. So what did we say? How did we link this to religion? Who can remember or who, who remembers what we said about instinct and religion? The big question that we were asking is, is religion instinctive or not? Is it something that we find in human beings naturally? Or is it something that you have to go learn on your own from the outside? That was the big question. So do we remember what was the answer and how we argued it? Yeah. Uh, firstly, you gave an example of uh, a uh, man that came to Imam al-Sadiq. Okay. And he asked, what is God? And then Imam Sadat responded by, imagine you're in a ship, or he asked, like, have you been in a situation where you're on a, a boat or a ship, and there's like a big storm, and you know you're going to die. There's 0% chance that you're gonna, this, anything's going to help you. He said, does your heart link with something? Then he said, the man said, yes, I've been in that situation, and yes, my heart linked with something, like a hope. And then he said, that link is God. So then, using that, we said that some people argued that religion is instinctive, some people didn't, and then the answer was yes, it was instinctive. 
Um, then we asked after that, can some instincts be stronger. stronger than others or born stronger? And then people responded by, uh, there can be environmental uh, factors. factors into it. So if you're born in a community where, I remember this as an example, in a community where competitiveness is encouraged or the community or the environment is very competitive, someone could be more competitive than someone that would be somewhere else. That's all very good. And so that linked to what I just said earlier, which is you can make an instinct stronger or weaker, for instance, by taking a course, or for instance, by being in a certain environment where you have people who push you in one direction or another, and then some of your instincts are going to become stronger or weaker. Okay, but the big question was then, so if religion is instinctive, can we rely on our instincts only and say, that's all I'm going to need to have the proper religion? That was the big question. So the starting point is, is religion instinctive? Is it something universal? Is it something that every human being has and they need? And what happens? The point we're trying to say is, if a human being has something that is an instinct, it's an instinctive need, any instinctive need in a human being, if you don't address it, if you don't fulfill it, if you don't give it what it wants in the proper way, you're going to have problems. It's going to cause diseases. It's going to cause illnesses. It's going to cause complexes. So it could be physical and it could be psychological. Yeah. I just have a quick question. When you were saying that it's instinctive, are you also comparing it to like how like humans also need like air, water, and food? Yes. So you're saying that religion is like one of the necessities that people need to like kind of survive. Yeah. Like properly. Yes. So we talked about that. Uh, maybe two lessons. So the types of needs that we have, they're not all the same. I don't know if you guys remember or not, the first two lessons we talked about the different dimensions of a human being. So one of them is definitely your body, okay? And you have very immediate needs. For instance, you need to eat, you need to sleep, you need to drink, right? So these are very immediate needs. And because they're corporeal, they're bodily, you feel it with your body. And things that you feel with your body, you feel right away. They're very concrete. They're very close to you. You feel them. You see them. You have five senses, right? The five senses tell you right away you're hungry. You have a headache. You're dehydrated. You need sleep. You're tired, right? Those are things that you feel right away. Human beings also have other types of needs. They have instinctive needs that are not bodily. They might start bodily, but they become non-bodily as a human being matures. For instance, human beings need love. That's a human need. If a baby is not, does not feel that it's loved enough as it grows, it does not grow into a normal human being. So it grows and it has complexes. It has issues. That person, as a baby, if they did not receive enough love or the opposite, for instance, there was the opposite of love. They felt hatred for too long. When they grow, they're not going to be able to interact with other human beings as a normal person, as a normal human being. They're not gonna, they might be social awkwardly, they might be violent, they might have, you know, some people are referred to, for instance, as a psychopath or a sociopath. Those are actual psychological illnesses or diseases or complexes. Where do they come from? There are issues that happened to the manner in which those instincts, the psychological instincts in a human being were dealt with, they were dealt with wrong. And that causes certain people to behave in these ways that don't even fit the normal mold of a human being. There are psychologists who spent a lot of time on this issue of religion. For instance, Sigmund Freud, for instance, one of his top students, Carl Jung. They spent a lot of time on this to say, you know, what's the conscious and the subconscious, the stuff that a normal human being feels and the stuff that's there, but they don't feel it right away. You need help to get to it, like what you see in a dream. A psychologist can take that out for you, can help you get to it, Make your mind go to it and find it. It's there, but we're not aware of it. Religion, those psychologists tell us, is like that. If you know how to drill deep into the psychology of a human being, you find the need for religion. Now, religion does not necessarily mean what we call religion. So, yes, for us, religion means Islam, you have your prayer and your fasting and your Quran and your Hsaniya. That's one way for religion to be seen in the outside world. That's not what we're talking about. 
deep inside your psychology, inside your soul, inside your mind, that's not what you find. What you find is a need in the human being to link with something infinite and absolute. You need for something to be sacred. And if you don't have that, you create it. You're going to go give something in your life that dimension. Whether you realize it or not, the sacredness will come from something. The meaning in your life will come from something. And that's why we linked it last week. That was the discussion that we had. The example that you gave, very, very good, very well. And we used also verses of the Qur'an that talk about what? That talk about that fear that a human being may feel where they're in an extreme situation. For instance, when you know you're about to die. You're at sea, the ship is broken, you have absolutely no hope. As the Imam said, you know, as he said, 0% chance. It's not that you have 5% chance, maybe. You know it's over. Your heart is still attaching itself to something or not. It's like your heart is hardwired, built in a way that if you push a human being enough, all the environmental factors go away. And that happens to, hu to animals too. If you push them to the breaking point, they go back to their most basic instincts. So the psychologists tell us that this is where you see the human need for religion, when human beings are pushed to the extreme conditions. And that's why there are so many psychologists that are coming with nowadays talking about the importance of religion, the importance of the meaning of life. Because if you don't have that, you're going to have mental problems in life. You're going to not be able to deal with the problems. You're going to have anxiety, mental issues, stress, so on and so forth. So they're saying if you attach it to things that keep changing, you're not going to be able to rely on them. You need something more stable. Before, if you go back 200, 500 years, the stable thing in society was religion, whatever religion that was. So depending on which, where you were in the world. And now, as we said, we haven't really started talking specifically about Islam or Tashayu or any of that. We're talking about the high level of religion. We're saying that if you go to the research of psychology, if you look at people who deal with people who have anxiety issues, who have mental health issues, and we're all hearing about these nowadays, whether it's at school, at work, and out there in the world, the ads that we see on TV, mental health is huge. And it has this whole portion of it. It comes out in these different angles. There's anxiety, there's stress, there's all these dimensions. Okay, so what's the issue? So people who are studying society and who spend the entire day doing therapy with people who have these issues, not to the point where, you know, I'm not feeling okay, to the point where I have to take pills and my life is falling apart and I cannot wake up in the morning, okay? Like really serious issues. Where is it coming from? They're telling us it's coming from the fact that people are struggling to find meaning in their lives. There used to be meaning that came from something stable in life, which was religion. That's the point that we've been trying to say over the past two, three lectures. And we say that that meaning should come out the most, not when things are going well. No one really thinks about the meaning of life when everything is going well. When you have a house and you have food and you feel good and there are no issues in life, things are easy. We resort, we go back to living our animal life this way. So we just deal with our animal basic instincts. It's when things start crumbling. It's when you're pushed and you have to struggle and deal with very difficult things in life. And of course, your difficulty is at your level, at your size. Okay? Someone who's running a country has very different difficulties than, you know, a student who's in grade six. Right? But everybody has difficulties. The more you feel them, the more you need meaning in your life. If you don't have meaning in your life, the difficulties are going to be too much and you're going to start crumbling. Because you don't have a reason to fight. You don't have a reason to stand up to the difficulties you're facing. What pushes you, what makes you stand up to the difficulties is the meaning that you put in your life. And that was the link that we made for those of you who attended in Shahar Muharram, the lectures, when we talked about if you look at what happened in Muharram, what gives people like Imam Hussein and those who were with him, what makes them be able to do what they did? And it's not just facing a difficulty. You're a group of maybe 70 facing an army of 30,000. It's the impossible odds. So what makes a human being still be able to face and instead of say, there's no point. Why do I fight this? Just let it be. And you crumble. 
you just collapse. What makes you fight it? What makes you stand up and say, no, no, I, I don't care how big it is. My meaning is bigger than that. I have so much meaning in my life for all of my actions to interpret everything that's going on that even that, it may look like it's an impossible situation for someone else, but to me that fits into my bigger plan. I can still deal with this. So the concrete example, the easy example in our life, and we used that in two or three uh, sessions ago, we said, imagine someone who doesn't believe in God. Imagine someone who thinks that the world is only this body, the things that we can see, the things that we can hear and touch and taste and feel, Okay, and they're going through life and life is good and they have their normal up days and down days, but things are good. And then they start struggling with real, real problems in life. Maybe a family member has a very awful disease. Maybe they get a very bad situation. And this is where you have to jump into the sacrifices that you have to make. Are you willing to sacrifice everything in your life for that person? What are you willing to let go? If I don't believe that there's anything after I die. The meaning in my life is the things I see and feel and hear. What's my reason for fighting for this person? What's my reason for sacrificing for this person? Now, keep that in mind. Now, let's take the example of someone who thinks that there's actually a God to the universe, a God who created every part of this universe and me, who has put in place certain laws and rules, and he sees and hears everything, and he sees me struggling in life, but I believe, that's the meaning that I have in my life, the second person, I believe that every time I struggle, so long as it's in the way he wants me to struggle, I'm getting rewarded for it. And if I sacrifice, I'm getting rewarded for the sacrifice. And if I have a problem, and I face the problem, and I don't just give up, Regardless of the outcome, I may fail. But I believe that my struggle itself is not lost. My struggle itself is going to be rewarded. Do you think that those two people are going to deal with the problems and the difficulties and the struggles of their life in the same way? That's the question. It may look nice and it may look the same and it may look like it's a waste of time and it may look like it's too much work to be religious or to... Okay, that's true. When things are going well, no problem. It's when there are struggles that start to appear and every life is full of struggles. And the more we go through life, the more we see struggles. But you see that people who have a really strong link with that dimension that we're calling your religious need that's internal to you, your link with the infinite, your link with the absolute... You can face any struggle. And so someone is going to be able to handle a lot more in life than someone else. Now, as we said, I may put that link to the absolute in something different than you do. But the need is there. After we recognize that the need is there, that psychologists refer to as a religious sense, then now we have to go and dig deeper and see what does that religious sense mean and where is it supposed to be. Just like we would do for any other instinct in the human being. And we say, okay, we all agree that we need to eat. But now we're going to, there's an entire field just to study what should we eat? And how should we eat it? And how often should we eat it? And what kind of food gives what kind of effect? Okay, that's a whole field. Well, the same thing with your religious sense. There's all these options. Now we have to start digging into them to see what does it actually mean for us to be religious. But we need to recognize that this is an actual need and that it has it serves a purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't put it in us for no reason. It's one more tool that he gave us to go through this life, to handle the issues of life. And as people study it over time, they start realizing, okay, so we really start seeing it when people have a struggle. And then we linked it last week in the Holy Quran where it says, the examples that we used, it says that people... The big problem that the Qur'an was, was happening in that society when the Qur'an was first revealed what, what was what? It's not that people didn't believe in anything. In that world, most people found it not very intelligent, found it ridiculous 
not to believe in any god. That didn't really exist in at the time when the Quran was revealed. The issue that they had, and so the Quran really fights that issue, the issue is that people believed in hundreds of gods or dozens of gods, each taking care of a clan and a tribe and a family or one thing in the world. Okay? That was the reality that the Quran was facing. If today the Quran came, maybe the issues are different in society. Maybe there is a little bit of that, but there's a lot more of people who just don't believe in God at all. Right? That's different. At that time, when you see the insistence of the Quran on shirk, it's because that was the reality of that environment. So the Quran says, if you look at those people, they associate partners with God. They say, all of these are our gods. And they would make them of wood, or dates, or rocks, and so on and so forth, and they would worship them. Until the real problems happened. For instance, they go at sea. And when they go at sea, they get into a situation where they sh they're sure that they're going to die. And the Quran says, so they pray to God, bring us back to land. And the Quran says, and then when we bring them back to land, what do they do? They go back to ascribing partners to God. So while they were going through the difficulty, suddenly they were praying sincerely to the one God. That's the attachment of the heart that you described. Now they were really truly attached to one thing. The infinite source of power, mercy, whatever you want to call it. But as soon as the struggle started looking like it's no longer that much of a danger and a risk, suddenly the situation changed. And they go back to the way they were before. They forgot the difficulty they were in. So the Quran is also telling us that human beings, just like the psychology tells us, when human beings are pushed into those extreme situations, suddenly they remember God. They go back to their religious instinct. This is when you start seeing it in everyone. But it appears in different people in different ways. So the big question that we were asking ourselves, that was our discussion last week, was obviously if we're recognizing that this is the proper situation to be in, it means that human beings are always in a distracted state. And they only really remember and they go back to the real state their real fitra, when they're put in these difficult situations, but they're rare. So, for us, if we want to be good, we want God to recognize us and us to recognize God and that relationship all the time. The question for us is, what do I need to do so that I'm not one of those people who only remembers God when I go into an extreme situation in my life? Why is it that I only remember him then and there. It looks very cheap. It's like you have a friend and the only time you remember them is when things are going really bad. You haven't talked to them in five years and then suddenly you pick up the phone and you call them. Why? What just happened? Okay, but that's what we do with God. Suddenly we remember. Things are going really bad. I need help. And usually he comes through <laughs> and we get the help. And then we go back to the same situation. So the question then becomes, why are we like this? And what do we need to do to pull ourselves out of that? And we talked about forcing ourselves to be in a situation of reminder. And reminder can mean all sorts of things. But that's to each one of us to think about, and that can become a, a very big topic. Okay, so that was kind of a recap, because I see a lot of new faces, and maybe some people missed some of the lectures. So that's kind of a recap of what we've said so far. Okay, and two. So we talked about instinct. That was the instinctive part. But the question was, so is that enough? And we said that's enough as a starting point to recognize that this is something inside of us, a need that we need to fulfill as a human being, to be full, to be fully healthy and to be a full human being. You need to take care of that dimension like you take care of everything else. It's another need. You need to study it. You need to understand it. You need to know what to do about it. Okay, but we said, can we rely on it only and not anything else and say yeah I'm religious I feel my need for religion and that's enough and we said no because this is something that changes based on the environment because this is something that changes from one person to another just like any other instinct some people are born with more or less some people are in an environment where one instinct is pushed more than another right 
We gave all these examples. So what did we say? We said that it's not something stable and fixed that we can rely on. We need something more rigid, more systematic, more real. So what is it? We said that's the theory. Theory is basically studying religion, doing what we're doing now. It's not just feeling it inside you. You need to actually think. You need to understand the notions. You need to get the tools. You need to go through subject matter and see, okay, how does it work? How does it not work? What's right? What's wrong? So you start studying it through reason, through your mind. So if you've recognized that there is that need, but you also know that you can't rely on it entirely because it changes depending on all sorts of things, then what can you rely on? What you need to rely on is to look at it with your mind. And that's what we call theory. Okay? So what we wanted to talk about today, but I'm not going to, I'll just announce the topic and then we'll get into it next week, inshallah, is the place of reason in our religion. So the cliché, the thing that we always hear is that our religion really likes the mind really pushes the mind, wants everything to be rational. But on the other side, what we hear about religion in general is that religion is a matter of just following blindly what your parents say or what religion says, and that's it. So the discussion that we were going to have today, but we took too long for the first part, the discussion that we wanted to have today was about the place of reason in our religion. We want to start from that as a starting point. We want to start to understand when we say that I'm a Muslim or I'm a Shi'i or whatever you want to say you are, we want to start understanding what does that mean. Things that you can check off to say, if you meet those, then you are in fact Muslim or not, in fact Shi'i or not. Okay, that's what we're going to start doing. And we want it to start with reason. The place of reason in our religion. Are you supposed to rely on reason or are you supposed to follow what you're told? Where does your reason start and stop? Do you use your reason throughout or does it have a specific part that this is the part that reason covers? And what is it? And what's the rest? It's covered by what? How do you know that you're doing the right thing? Is the right thing to follow blindly? As people say, religion is a matter of just following blindly. There are superstitions and myths and weird things and you learn them from your parents or you go to the mosque and you hear the sheikh or go to the church and hear the priest and that's it. Maybe that's religion because a lot of people say that's what religion is. And then we hear, I think, enough of us have heard enough to, about our religion being very rational, reasonable, intellectual. So what does it mean? Can I just make it up? If my reason doesn't accept, I reject it. If my reason accepts, I take it. Is that what it means? So that's the discussion we wanted to have today. So I'm going to leave that with you. Next time we meet, we start with that. Okay, I want you to think about it. What is the place of reason in our religion? Okay, that's a good discussion. Good starting point for next time. So that's it for, for part one of the Jalsa. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين So I actually have a question about uh, Imam Ali's dad yeah, What was his role in society at the time where like, the Prophet was around and how did he like, cause I, like I listen to people saying how he's not a Muslim but he has he still has a religion he was probably like, following what Nabi Ibrahim uh, religion at that time. So, like, what kind? Of, what was his role in? So this is how where we have to start. So to go back to your question. So today we the first comment that we had was one of the brothers saying, "Is it okay if I go and what can I take and what can I not take?" And it depends when I say you, depending on what tools you have. So the official version in Sunni history is that the Prophet's father and Imam Ali's father specifically were non-Muslims, non-believers. And in fact, they claim that those people are being tortured in hell in their graves until the Day of Judgment. Okay? Pardon me? 
Yeah, so basically the argument, when you retrace it back in history and you see how it was built, created, why it was made, why is there attack, an attack on the father of Imam Ali alayhi salam? It's because this is just one more distinction that the Imam Ali has, that there is no counter to it. None of the companions of the Prophet have fathers, have parents, who played a role like the role of the father of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And that role was? And that role was that he protected the Prophet and he raised him for many, many years until he died of hunger because he gave all his wealth and he defended the Prophet until the end of his time. The only thing that we can say about the father of Imam Ali alayhi salam is that he didn't outwardly say, I am a Muslim, in those words. That's all that can be said. But if we look at the way he lived, we look at the sacrifices he made, we look at how he taught his sons to live, and he instructed them and, and commanded them and ordered them to become Muslims and to defend the Prophet with their blood and with their sword until the last breath. And he would put them all around the Prophet when the Prophet was young and he would sleep so that if anyone would attack, they would kill his sons before the Prophet. And he used all his wealth to protect the Prophet all the time, like throughout the years, until the last three years of, of, of his life when Quraysh basically made it so difficult for the Holy Prophet and anyone who associated with him that they decided to cut all interactions with them. So people were no longer allowed to sell to them, to buy from them, to marry from them, to have any interaction with them. Basically, they wanted to kill them off. And Quraysh would punish or kill anyone who interacted with anyone who associated with the Prophet. So what did they do? The Prophet went to this place between two mountains that is a valley, let's say, okay, that was between two mountains so that the Prophet and those with him, the few dozens who lived with the Holy Prophet and they grew in numbers over time, three years in that place, and they lived under the protection of Abu Talib. And Abu Talib spent everything he had and defended them with his life until he died of hunger. So can you really say that person who does this, and if you go into his, his life, there are too many instances to cite how he says that the Holy Prophet is the person who, if the rain stops in his verses of poetry, there are over 300 verses of poetry that you can read. Muslims don't have poetry as loyal and as faithful to the Prophet as he does. And yet they say he wasn't a, a believer. They say, he basically says the Holy Prophet is the one whose face is used as intercession when the rain doesn't come down. If the rain stops coming and the desert, we live in an environment that is, uh, a, a desert and people are dying of thirst and the animals are dying and a famine is about to happen you use the holy prophet and his face the whiteness of his face as intercession to God to make it rain does someone who say that not believe who the holy prophet is does someone who doesn't believe in the holy prophet and his message order his son Ja'far and his son Ali Imam Ali alayhi salam and Ja'far al-Tayyar would he tell them, go as if he saw the Holy Prophet standing? And they were young. And they would, he would see the Holy Prophet praying without anyone beside him. He would tell them, go pray beside him. Don't let him ever be alone. And if you see him praying, go pray with him. And why is it that he became the custodian of the Holy Prophet after the grandfather? After the grandfather, Holy Prophet Abdul Muttalib passed away, who took him over? And then you see the, the manner in which Abu Talib raised the Holy Prophet. And it's not just him, it's his wife too, attacked in the Sunni literature as being non-believers. And then you read our version, and you don't really just need to read our version. There are hints here and there in their version that start looking like it's completely inconsistent. So all of this, his only crime was that he was the father of Imam Ali. And Imam Ali is this person that you cannot compete with. And so that creates huge problems. So why is he not the first Khalifa? So we have to bring him down from every angle we can. So his, his mother was not good. His father was not good. He was not good. He got drunk and he came to pray. One, one thing after another. And then the merits that the Holy Prophet gave to Imam Ali were flipped. And they said, oh, he said this about someone else. And he said that about someone else as merits. Actually, he didn't. We have in our wayat that the Holy Prophet told Imam Ali salam that the only person who's allowed to carry the title of Amir al-Mu'mineen is him. And he is the Amir, the prince of the believers in this world and the next. 
That's the first thing that they took away from Imam Ali. Right away after every Khalifa became Amir al Mu'minin until today, where they say someone is Amir al Mu'minin. Right? And this is like the, the, the things that don't mean anything. It's just a title. Who cares? But, but it means something. And it's an indication of a lot more things. Right? It's, it starts showing you the tip of the iceberg. So this is where we say it's okay to go and it's okay to listen, but you need to equip yourself. You need to ask questions. You need to say, does it make sense for someone who behaved in this way, who sacrificed in this way, who lived his life in this way, to at the end be a non-Muslim who is being punished and tortured in his in a box in his grave until the day of judgment, as they claim? Is it possible that the Holy Prophet would have asked for God's forgiveness up to 70 times for him and God rejected it? Because there's a verse in the Quran that says that even if you ask forgiveness for them 70 times, they say this is about the father of Imam Ali or about his own father, the Holy Prophet. Does that make sense? So, anyways, that's just to ask some questions to make people think. The easy answer to this is just go back to the Imams السلام, and say, see what they say about the father of Imam Ali. That's the simple answer. Where they tell us there's a story in the Quran of Mu'min Al Fir'aun. And in Surah Ghafir, his story is explained how there was this man who was basically a hidden believer. Who, when he saw how the people were treating Musa السلام, and how they were rejecting him and how they were, he came to them and he told them, you know, give him a chance. If he is right, then you're all going to be winners. And if he's wrong, no one is losing anything. It's his problem. Why are you being, why are you acting in this manner against him? And the reality of the Quran basically says that this was a very, very good man, but he kept his faith hidden so that he can actually influence society. Okay? And that's where the Quran teaches us to be smart and to know how to behave. And so you go back to the Ruwayat of Ahl al-Bayt where they tell us Abu Talib was just like Mu'min al-Fir'aun. He was a man who kept his faith hidden so that he could better, better protect the Holy Prophet. If he had openly said, I am now Muslim, he would have been persecuted and killed like everybody else. So long as he did not say, I am a Muslim, they couldn't do anything. He was considered the Lord of Quraysh. So he would use his power and his title to protect the Holy Prophet. Because he's not, he hasn't said yet, I am a Muslim. No one knows what he's doing in private. No one knows what's in his heart. What we do know is his behavior is he did not let anyone come to the Prophet. And the few times that history tells us that they dared to do anything to the Prophet, like the time when they he heard, they came to him and they told him that they had put the placenta, which is when a camel gives birth, there's all the blood and, and the, the sac, the amniotic sac and everything else comes out with the baby. They took that and they dropped it on the Holy Prophet as he was praying in front of the Kaaba. The Mushrikeen. And so history tells us he asked all his 13 of his sons and his family members and he came and he told them, put all of your swords under your clothes and come with me. And he went to the Kaaba and he asked them to stand at the heads of the people that he knew would have done this to the Prophet. And he told them, if any of you ever do anything like this ever again, you harm him or touch him or disrespect him, your heads will be cut off. And if you think I'm kidding, basically, watch me. And he told them, take out your swords. And so the, they were standing there at the heads of Quraysh. And they took out their swords and they put them on their necks. Because they were sitting there laughing while the Prophet was praying. Does someone who behave in this way, who risks everything, can we really say he's not a Muslim and he's not a believer? And, and, and this is well documented. This is in history in theirs and in ours. But they say, despite all of that, all of that was only motivated in him because this was his nephew. No other reason. It's just a family tie. Really? Did he do that with anyone else? Did the Prophet deal with people as family ties only? He has one of his uncles who goes to hell. The Prophet doesn't mind that. He says this guy is bad, this guy is good. This family member is special. This one is, is good, but he's not special. Right? So the relationships are not about family ties. Yes, they do have family ties, but that's not why you see one behavior and not another. There's a belief behind this. If he believes that this is God's prophet and he's about to be sent with a message for humanity and he has a role to play to protect him, to make him be able to leave Mecca 
and go to Medina and play his prophetic mission, that's going to explain a lot more what we saw from the behavior of Abu Talib than what we hear is claimed against him. صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله الطيبين